Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our worship service. I'm Pastor John, Vicar John, and uh, I'll be leading your worship. Uh, I just have a couple of announcements to make before we begin. This is uh, basically for the week of, of uh, February 11th, 2018, and uh, the reason that I'm doing this is that God laid this on my heart, that I should be doing something uh, to, to try to reach people out in cyberspace. And this is a cyber worship service, and I hope that you can tell other people it's there. I know there are millions of people uh, in cyberspace and everywhere else that don't attend church, they don't worship, uh, they have no spiritual life. And I want to help you to find your way to Jesus Christ and fulfill your life. If So if you're having a life that's not so great, uh, stay tuned, watch us and uh, we'll see if we can help you out through Jesus Christ. And this is all about him and not about me. Uh, anyway, um, the uh, uh, website isn't up yet. My website maker has been sick, so that's not, uh, we can't, we can't uh, uh, do that. Uh, and, and we will be soon, and, and I, hopefully the microphone works a little bit better now, as I got one of these things, so uh, uh, let's, uh, Let's do that. And also, of course, if you want music with your worship, uh, you should be on YouTube at this point. And just push, push the pause button and uh, go find some, some wonderful uh, hymns, Christian music. There's, there's lots of them out there. And just play your favorites whenever you feel the need. Uh, anyway, so let's, uh, after the announcement, let's begin our worship with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We ask that you put the Holy Spirit upon us. Uh, today, as we come to worship you and only you, and if there's any bad spirits in our midst, Lord, just cast them out. Whether it's at a house or an apartment or wherever we may be, Lord, just cast them right out. Cast them out in the street. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our call to worship this morning, or today, comes from uh, uh, Psalm 1, verses 4 through 6. The call to worship. The wicked are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked, wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The words of God for the people of God and all God's people said, praise be to God. Thank you. Uh, now we have a time where we have joys and concerns, and I know you have many, many joys and many concerns in your life, and just uh, jot those down now. And when I say that we're going to have a little silent prayer, then you uh, go to uh, go to them, go to him at this point, and and uh, and raise them up to him. Uh, uh, I just have uh, our two babies that I'm going to pray for, and of course uh, the family of Dan, who's uh, had his uh, 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 both hands. Uh, amputated this week and uh, in one foot and, and toes and uh, due to fr uh, frostbite and freezing. So uh, anyway, so uh, if you're in this country, cold is deadly, so just be aware of that. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, let's go to a time of prayer now as we bring our, our, our people to the Lord and, and I'll begin and then we'll have a word, a uh, moment of silent prayer and then we'll continue on. Pray with me. Oh Lord, we come here today, knees bowed and body bent, before the throne of, of, the, of thy grace. We come this more, the, today like empty pitchers to a full fountain, with no merits of our own. Gracious Lord, bless us through, through your Holy Spirit during this time. And now, Lord, we come to you with a moment of silent prayer. Gracious Lord, we, we, we thank you once again for all the love you give us in this world and all that's in it, everything you made just for us. And we just thank you for that, Lord. And today we ask that, uh, that you help us to make uh, inroads to people that, that uh, don't know you, uh, whether it's out here in cyberspace like we are today or just in your real world, uh, in our real world, wherever it may be, Lord, wherever, whatever city, whatever town, help us to model your behavior. Help us to talk about you. Help us to be bold, Lord, uh, in our in our witness to you, Lord. We just thank you for this opportunity, Lord. This morning, we would like to hold up some people, and we would ask that you. Uh, Bless them in ways that are pleasing to you, Lord. We're, once again, we're thinking of the poor and the hurting throughout the world, throughout the country, throughout our neighborhoods. Lord, help us once again to make inroads uh, through, 
food or clothing or whatever we can help with. Lord, just help us to do these things in your name. Lord, we ask that you be with our leaders, wherever they may be, whatever they are doing, Lord. Uh, they seem to have forgotten you. Uh, they, some give lip service and some are real Christians, Lord, and love you, Lord. And, and we just ask that uh, you help them to, to uh, build that fire for you, Lord, and just to spread it all through the capital, throughout the world, Lord. We just thank you for that, Lord. We ask that you be with our troops wherever they may be. We ask that you also uh, uh, be with our communities, Lord, as we are still in winter and there's many changes and unsettled weather. Just keep us safe, Lord, until we can meet again next week. And we just thank you and praise you, Lord, for all of this as, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And once again, uh, as, as we are in our time of prayer, you could stop that at any time if I go too fast and, and just push pause and, and, uh, and we can continue on. Our uh, reading this today comes from, I always want to say this morning because I've been a pastor for a long time and, I, and it just, just seems right, but whatever time of day it is, uh, we are in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians this morning, today, <laughs> once again, and uh, we're ver verses 12 through 22. And this section is called the resurrection of the dead. But if, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. So is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, <clears throat> but he did not raise him. In fact, the dead were, are not raised. For if they are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And, if you're, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The words of God for the people of God, and all God's people would say, praise be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you once again, and we ask that the words of my mouth be your words, and they fall upon open ears and open minds, and especially open hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever watched a, a football or a basketball game where one player acts like he's the only star on the team? Uh, uh, you know, uh, they aren't, of course, uh, because uh, uh, there are others, but they like to think like that, and, and, uh, and this, this happens. And, and I get a, get a huge charge out of science in a similar vein. Some scientists think they're out there finding and making uh, all things that have never been made or found before. They, they often get a very puffed ego like our, like our athletes. The same can be said uh, about other th fields too, in, in our, especially in our fast changing computer world, cyber world. What the layperson fails to realize is that if there is something that isn't discovered by this person here, it will pro in all prob probability be discovered very soon, very shortly by someone over here or, or in a foreign country. In just about all breakthrough discoveries in science or applied science, there will be someone else who is on the very verge of the same breakthrough. That is just the way it is. Uh, also, Nothing is being made or discovered that hasn't been done before. God discovered all of these things. He knows all about these things. And he waits for us to find what he already knows. And, and I, for one, find a lot of comfort in this alone, this thought. You can't, you can't outdo God. So put your ego away 
and let God help you. Uh, today we are going to look at something similar as we talk about the resurrection. Uh, let's see how this uh, can help you uh, or help us in our world today. Do any of uh, the adults, people here uh, listening today, uh, remember their geography lessons from when they were in uh, elementary school? Well, Troy Borst remembers his lessons that he learned when he learned that the southernmost uh, place in Africa is a point where for centuries had experienced terrible storms. For decades, no one knew what lay beyond the Cape because it was because no ship ever attempting to go around it had ever returned to tell the story. The ancients called it the Cape of Storms for good reason. Then a Portuguese explorer of the 16th century, Vasco da Gama, I, I love that name, Vasco da Gama, that's the reason why I remember this story. But anyway, he just successfully sailed, sailed around that very point and found that beyond the wild and raging seas, lay a calm ocean, and beyond that lay the shores of India. The name of the, play, the Cape was changed from the Cape of, of Storms to the Cape of Good Hope. Before Jesus rose from the dead on that Easter morning so many years ago, death had been the Cape of Storms on which all hopes of life beyond had been wrecked. No one knew what lay beyond that point until the first Easter morning. Then those ancient visions of Isaiah turned to became the victory of Jesus Christ over our last great enemy. Jesus had defeated Satan and death. This is the greatest event, the greatest event that has ever happened in human history, bar none. Suddenly, like those ancient explorers, we could see beyond death to the hope of heaven and, the, and of eternal life with the Father. Furthermore, we dare to believe and we dare to believe that we shall experience in our own lives exactly what Jesus experienced in his because of the because the risen Christ has said to us the risen Christ has said to us because I believe because I pardon me because I live you shall live also that is a comfort that is a great comfort and it is the heart of our faith today as we get closer to the Easter season, and I would like you to, to attend or somehow uh, uh, go to a Lenten, uh, Ash Wednesday service uh, this coming Wednesday. They, they, are, they are great. Uh, but as we get closer, I would like to take a look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So far, Paul has written quite a letter to the Corinthians. He writes about the spiritual gifts and, and how they interact uh, uh, with the body of Christ, which we are. Uh, we took a look at the love chapter, remember, about how much God loves us in chapter 13. Uh, Paul goes on, he writes about the proof that Jesus was exactly who he said he was, and he still is today. And today we'll look at why the resurrection is so important to Christians and everyone else. Josh, Mc Josh McDowell stated in one of his books that all but four of the major religions of the world are based on mere philosophical propositions. In other words, they contain no concrete, but only philosophy. They, all, they are all philosophy or wind, and there are no witnesses for any of these other religions. Of the four that are based on personalities rather than philosophies, only Christianity claims to have an empty tomb of its founder. In 1900 BC, the Jewish father, father Abraham died. In 483 BC, Buddhist writings tell us that Buddha died. On June 6th, 623 AD, Muhammad died. In 33 AD, Jesus died. However, he was raised from the dead and came back to life and appeared to over 500 people or witnesses in 40 days. Then some of the witnesses went on to write what they had actually seen, the resurrection. Paul really stresses the point, this point in, in the passage this morning and in many other places. Have you ever wondered why he wrote about it so much? I, I think there are some uh, very special reasons for this. And the first one is that these people, the Corinthians, they had no prior experience with Jesus. This was something totally new to them. They were pagans and Jews. The Jews, of course, were waiting for the Messiah. And they still are today. 
and here Paul is telling him that the Messiah has come. He has come and fulfilled the scriptures of the Old Testament. Pagans, on the other hand, had no experience with Jesus either. As a matter of fact, they had no experience with a God who would walk on this earth. Even though we call them pagans, they were not non-religious. They had religions. They had many religions, and just about all of them had something in common. To them, God lived in heaven uh, and, and was perfect. And I think we can go along with that. That's, that's a good uh, concept. Uh, to, the, to them, man or humankind lived on earth and was totally corrupt. And I think we can go along with that. Just read your papers or watch the news. Uh, most, if not all, the religions involve some sort of process by which we can get to heaven and perfection. It was alien for them to think that God could come to earth because earth was evil and corrupt and God was perfect. Therefore, God couldn't come to earth because he couldn't be in a place that wasn't perfect. This is called dualism, and it's the basis for most religions uh, today. That, and this, is, in a nutshell, is, is what they, many believed. And they believed, in, in, and they believed this in many ways, as there were many, many different religions in those days. So what Paul is trying to do here, as he writes, is, is gather the people of the church back together with the truth. There is something, this is something that we need today also. We need the truth. And the truth is that Jesus was resurrected. He is telling them that this is the most important part of the story because without it, without the resurrection, we just have another worthless religion. For if Jesus died and was resurrected, then we too will be raised from the dead, back to life, to live uh, in eternity with God. And I, for one, am really looking forward to this. And this is one of the problems that just about all religions of the world have with Christianity today. They have all different kinds of beliefs. One teaches soul sleep, where the body dies and disintegrates while the, while the soul or spirit sleeps. Materialists believe that death is utter extinction. No one survives death. Some teach reincarnation, where, where the soul or spirit is recycled into another form or body. Uh, you know, maybe waste management, waste management Recycle Center comes and picks them up or something like that. And there are many variations of this theme. Others believe in absorption, where, where the spirit returns back to the ultimate source or div divine being, like, like a big dumping ground for the spirits. Others believe that there is no sin and all, all behavior is acceptable. It takes a lot of faith to believe in any of these because there is absolutely no proof. We still have a lot of dualism that I just talked about where God is good and everything else is evil, on earth is evil. This is the belief of Islam. That's, that's why they get so upset when we bring up that Jesus is God. They believe fanatically that Jesus could not have been God because he walked on this earth. If he was on this earth, then he had to be evil because all who are on earth are evil. And if he is evil, then he cannot be God because God is good. You can see this is a form of circular thinking. For these people, their earthly bodies are the last thing that they want to take with them to eternity. Hopefully this can help us understand uh, these people a little bit better. And it's not only in and it, and it is only in Christianity that we have a God who loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to walk among us, to teach us, and to die for us. But if the story ended there, he would have been long forgotten. He, we would have no religion. Even the disciples wanted to go right back to their old jobs right after the death of Jesus on the cross. It was only after he was resurrected that the disciples finally started to understand who Jesus really was. So Paul goes on to tell us that if the resurrection did not happen, then the following things would happen. First, preaching the gospel would be meaningless. If we have no resurrection, that Jesus did not conquer death, and then death and Satan would be the victors. Unless Jesus conquers these, the gospel is meaningless. Also, faith in Jesus Christ would be worthless. Preaching about Jesus would have no meaning. There, it would have, there would be no purpose in it. A dead Savior cannot uh, give us life. If the dead did, do not rise, Christ did not rise, and we 
will not rise. Thirdly, all witnesses to and preachers of the resurrection would be liars. If there is no resurrection, then all people who saw Jesus after the cross are liars. And this includes Paul and all the writers of the New Testament would be liars. The implications here just go far beyond our imagination. Fourthly, all people would still be in their sins. This would be devastating. If Christ had not been raised, then we would have no forgiveness of sins or salvation or reconciliation. We would have no spiritual life, no eternal life, and no hope. Christianity is responsible for all the good things of this world. Let me repeat that. Christianity is responsible for all the good things of this world. Uh, so without the resurrection, we would still be living in a very primitive world and society. Also, all Christians that have ever lived have, would, would have perished. Paul and all the others uh, would have had their faith in vain. Their sins would be unforgiven and their destination would be hell. And lastly, we would be the most pitiful people on the earth. Without the resurrection, our religion would be pointless and pitiful. Paul paints a picture of doom and gloom in verses 12 through 19. He wants us to know just how futile our lives would be without Jesus. I'm here to tell you today that life without Jesus is futile today also unless you have Jesus as your personal Savior. And all you have to do for this is to confess your sins to, to Jesus and ask him to live in your heart. This will be the best move that you ever, ever make. Then Paul changes direction and comes on strong from verse 20 and on. He, he, he turns it around. Jesus has indeed been raised from the dead. For all died when Adam died, and we should all be made alive in Christ as he was made alive. This is our hope. This is what our faith is based on. We have seen that we are all dead to sin, to the sin of the world. But we will, we will all be made alive again through the death and resurrection of Jesus. All the things that Paul is telling us up to now are true. He has been giving them and us proof that now all is true. We are fast approaching the Easter season. Uh, the resurrection is the message of the Easter season. This is a season that's really more important than Christmas or any other season. This is a season where we get strength purpose and eternal life this is the good news season there's a story i ran across by alan smith about a missionary who discovered a troop <coughs> a tribe of uh, indians in uh, deep in the jungles of brazil they lived near a large river and they were friendly and they needed some medical attention there was a terrible contagious disease that was ravishing their village there were people dying every day the only uh, in, uh, uh, Infirmary was quite a journey away, and the only way to get to it was they had to cross this river, and that the tribe was not willing to do. They thought the river contained evil spirits. The, the, if they entered the river, they believed that they would have certain death. So the missionary explained to them that he had to cross the river to get to them, and he was unharmed. But they did not believe him. So he led the people to the river, and he stuck his hand into it. And they still did not believe him. Then he walked into the river, and he splashed some water up on himself. Now, he got their interest, <coughs> but they were still hesitant. They still didn't believe. Finally, <coughs> excuse me, he dove into the river and swam beneath the surface and came up on the other side. And he came up on the water, uh, out of the water on the other side with his fist raised in the air as he had beaten the river. The legend was false. The Indians cheered and followed him across. Jesus Christ came to this world to find a people who were enslaved to their fear of death. He tried to explain to them that they had nothing at all to fear, but they would not believe him. He touched a boy and brought him back to life, and still they did not believe. He brought life into the body of a dead girl but the people were still cynical. He even let a dead man lay in the grave for four days before calling him out and raising him. Even after this, this was not enough for the people to believe. It was necessary for Jesus 
to dive into that river and stay submerged for three days before coming out on the other side. It was only then, after the people realized that death had been conquered, Jesus had destroyed the one who had the power over death. He had destroyed Satan and death. Today I'm here to tell you that I believe in the resurrection and I will stake my life on it. I know that Jesus is God. I repented of my sins and asked him to live in my heart and he changed me 100%. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, if he can change a life like I used to have, then he can do anything. As we close today, we can see that Paul has given us all the proof we need. Modern scholars can give you some more if you need that. That plus all uh, the rest of the Bible points to a new beginning, the resurrection. And this is your hope. This is your future. This is the door that opens the plan of our Lord's love for you. This is the knowledge that your eternal life is secure. Praise the Lord. And thank you, Jesus, for first loving us. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we live in a world where science and all kinds of things try to try to impress us the most. But Lord, you have never proven, there's never been anything proven about you that is wrong, Lord. The, you have never told a lie. You are great and you offer us eternal life through your death. Help us, Lord, to believe in you and only you and nothing else. And we just praise you for this love you give us, this love that's just unimaginable. Thank you, Jesus, again. In your name we pray. Amen. That concludes our service for today. Uh, I would like to invite you back next week. Uh, you'll find us uh, on Facebook uh, under Vicar John, YouTube under Vicar John, and soon to be a website, but it's not up yet. I've tried it uh, under Vicar John, and we'll have it all for you. And, and uh, maybe we can blog, and you can get in touch with me through any of those any of those ways, however you can. Uh, thank you for being with us and, and uh, go in God's peace. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you as you go out into this wonderful world that he made just for you, spreading his great joy through his story. Go in God's peace. Amen. <laughs>